Hello, this is the second video in a video series focused on the experience of writing a YA fantasy series with a co-writer and indie publishing that YA fantasy series with that co-writer. And today we'll be focusing on publishing the very first book in the series, which was called The Changeling's Fortune. It is was published in May 25th, 2018, and it was Casey's first publication and my second. My first book came out in summer of 2017. It was also self-published. And yeah, although The Changeling's Fortune wasn't a first book for me, my goodness, did this book and its release have just a lot of first book problems. Um, but there were also a few things we did right, thank goodness. So like, let's look at like, two notable problems and two things that we did right and then we'll just kind of wrap it up with final takeaways in regards to co-writing this book and regards into the general and in regards to the general publication so let's get into it the first problem was pacing oh boy casey and i have edited the first few chapters of this book several times because my goodness the pacing was very slow. I still think the first chapter has always been very strong, but the second and third chapters after that were basically like, they're basically character establishing chapters. Um, the second looked at how Deirdre, who is a fairy changeling who's being raised in a Catholic orphanage, like grew up. Like, what is her youth like? You know, how did she wind up going to the post apocalyptic Neo London? Post apocalyptic is a little bit of a stretch, but there was a nuclear bombing on London, so like, there's some, definitely a level of the apocalypse vibe there a bit. Anyways, the third chapter, look at James, who's the son of extremely anti-fairy general, who lives in New London, who was born and raised there, and his childhood, along with the disappearance of his mother and the tension between himself and his father. Um, James's chapter did help kick off the main plot line by showing his intention to basically run away from home and find his long lost mother in the wilds with the fairies and the monsters. Um, yeah, but there was just a little too much information on his childhood. Same thing with Deirdre. There were just too many little stories about her growing up in the orphanage. And honestly, that is the joy of indie publishing. Like, you can go back and edit the books as much as you want. Um, it's awesome. <laughs> We've cut down those chapters to focus on the most essential information in order to, like, help things get going a bit more quickly. I still think that the pacing of the book it's a first book. This is like extremely common. And so like, yeah, you might be asking like, why is pacing a first book problem? And like, now to be fair, there are books that are not first books that like can have just absolutely abhorrent pacing. But I do find that young or newer writers or writers who are publishing their first book and just wanted to make it look really freaking awesome. Um, they do tend to have a slower pacing in their first published book. And I think that in our case, things were a little slower because we love these characters so much. We were so excited about them and we just wanted to like share everything <laughs> and we forgot that the reader just isn't going to be as interested as we were. Like all this stuff from their childhood was like 100% interesting to us, but like the reader doesn't really have much reason to care yet. Like beginning writers can, or young writers or writers who are just really excited about their characters can easily forget that like it's a job of the writer to basically convince the reader to care about the main characters. And in our case, things were moving a bit slowly to the point where modern indie readers who es expect like snappy pacing just weren't getting engaged to where a bond between themselves and the main characters could be formed. I still find that some of, um, even after we've done the editing, I still find that some um, of our readers are like, oh, it moves too slow, which, like, that's fair. Like, it is definitely, I think, is one of our slower-paced books in the series. Pro and, like, again, it's whenever you're starting to build the world and it's your first book, I think that's just such an easy problem to fit in, to fall into. And, again, this is a case-by-case -case basis because we also have readers who are like, oh, I, I enjoyed being able to get to know the characters and all this kind of stuff. So, like, yeah, it's, um, again different strokes for different folks kind of deal. I mean, we did, again, we did go back and trim the proverbial fat. It was definitely necessary. And also, if I was writing this book now, I think that what I would have done was cut down the second chapter, which is Deirdre's chapter, even more, and, like, deliver some of the anecdotes in it via flashbacks later in the book. Um, we would still, like, have some time with her in the second chapter, um, but, like, yeah, it would be more dispersed throughout the book. And I think it is... It's cool. 
it's good. I don't think we're going to be editing it again anytime soon. But um, yeah, it's definitely not the modern indie reader standard. Um, I think a lot of modern indie readers really enjoy like almost like in media res, like just like snappy, 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 starting with the action right away. This first thing that I think we did pretty well was um, getting sensitivity readers. So like several of our main characters are Romani and Casey was in charge of them. She was writing their POVs and everything. She did heaps and heaps of research to present them and their culture, you know, as well as possible. But research isn't really necessarily enough. So like she also got a sensitivity reader to help us out. Um, a sensitivity reader is basically like a consultant you go to when writing about a culture, religion, life experience, etc. that you have not personally experienced. Um, and it's really awesome to get the sensitive, sen excuse me, the sensitivity reader's insight and perspective. It really helped make our work stronger. Also, the sensitivity reader also was familiar with um, a, a, um, British English. So, you know, helped us fix those uh, American English things that we were doing in that book because we were, we were, we were trying. We were trying to avoid American slang and things like that. I remember researching and all that, but like, yeah, there were, there were some things left over. And so, yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty awesome. Um, and to be honest, I also want to just pat Casey on the back here because she did so much research that the, basically, we didn't have to change tons of stuff. It was mostly just tweaks here and there. So sensitivity readers and research are both very important important and i think casey nailed them nailed it she did she done good the second first book problem oh boy was promotions and i call this the first book problem because i think that is just it's so easy whenever you're starting out to not to not know what you're doing in regards to doing promotion in the world of indie publishing i mean i'll be honest i'm still not a whiz at, at promos and marketing but i didn't know what i was doing back then even more so like the world of indie book promotion is constantly changing like in 2018 we were just moving out of like book bloggers being the big thing like they're still a thing now but like they're, they're nowhere near as influential as they were back in like um i guess say 2015 or something like that i think that instagram's where it's at for book publication and promos but now it's starting to move to tiktok so yeah, it's just constantly changing. Um, we didn't know what we were doing, so we just kind of tried everything. <laughs> we got a book blog tour, interviews, we did self-promo on our own blogs, we contacted reviewers. Ironically, the one thing that we didn't do that we should have done was get ARC readers. ARC stands for um, Advanced Review Copy, ARC, and ARCs are given to readers for free who in exchange will rate and review your work, hopefully. And they'll do an honest rating and review. Like, I'm sure that there are companies where they're like, you're basically buying good reviews, but that's no, <laughs> please don't do that. That's, that is no, no, no. Anyways, ARCs are so important to get your book traction and basically just, you know, it's really good whenever there's a new book out and it already has a good number of reviews and ratings because ARC, viewer, ARC reviewers got their hands on it. So they're there ready to rate and review it, you know, whenever it comes out and Amazon likes good. That's one thing that I think is still true is that Amazon really likes lucrative new releases. But don't quote me on that. Again, this is, is everything changes so often. Anyways, we did try to give out ARCs via, oh, we did try via library thing. That was a massive flop. I think that we gave out several even like hard copy books I, I i'm not sure but like nothing we got nothing so don't like don't mm -mm, i don't in my experience library thing is not worth your time and money but to be fair maybe if we were more established authors or maybe if we were writing in other genres maybe we would have more success via library thing um yeah, just like if you are a writer, you're looking at doing ARC reviews, be very careful you know, where you invest your time and money with ARC reviews and things like that, getting hold of ARC reviewers, because a lot of places that sound like they should be good often aren't. <laughs> like, I know that there are so many like mixed reviews of doing like ARC, ARC, re ARC reviews, ARC reviewers and stuff on like Goodreads, like, oh my gosh, and I have some kind of some experience with that. So like, be careful. <laughs> um, don't, yeah, we, 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 we tried. We, we did. We flopped too. We, you know, you always make some mistakes, but oh my gosh. Anyways, we did contact like another like re blog reviewing thing, but like, oh my gosh, we didn't realize that they generally do like, like adult, <laughs> adult books. <laughs> our book is not that. Um, luckily the reviewers still liked our work, 
which is good. But um, that was my bad. I was I was in charge of reaching out to that reviewer, blogger, person. Um, so just double check, <laughs> double check. Don't be like me. Make sure whoever you're contacting is actually like interested in your genre because they're gonna be like why am i getting this ya fantasy fluff stuff whenever i am reviewing adult books i think our release was fair given how little pre-publication marketing we did but like man if we had done more and like had found a better arc distribution website or websites like it could have been so much better anyways the second thing we did right was the cover um so like books have covers to judge them and having a professional cover is highly preferable. So while we didn't like get a professional book cover artist or company to design the whole cover, we did get a professional artist to draw an illustration for it. So we were able to like, you know, make a cover from that because we both had Photoshop. And it wasn't like as a, as a whole in the end, it wasn't the best design. We have since replaced it. But like, yeah, like the picture itself, nice composition on the whole the cover wasn't bad. And finally, what is the biggest takeaway from this publication process of the first book? Well, I guess there are two big takeaways. And the first is in regards to co-writing. What really stood out to me about co-writing this book was that, honestly, I was so pleasantly surprised that you can't very easily tell our chapters apart, in my opinion. In this book, like, I wrote the chapters from Deirdre's point of view, and Casey wrote the ones from James, Ian, and... Callista's POVs. Oh, and Alan. <laughs> yeah, Casey did a lot of the lifting in this book. Thank you, girl. But I was so worried that like our styles would clash within the book. But like we managed to avoid that because what we do is that we line edit each other's work. Like once we've like edited any big content issues on our first draft, we go through and we make suggestions on each other's works on like um ways to tighten, strengthen, trim, etc. The word choice or idea presentations or paragraph structure. So like by using each other's suggestions as needed, basically my writing voice is an her chapter sum and her writing voice is in mine as well. It all comes together pretty well in the end, I think. And um, the biggest takeaway in regards to publishing in general was just <laughs> was just expectations for my very first indie book, except for No Longer Hidden. Um, but for some reason, okay, No Longer Hidden didn't take off, but like I didn't do that much for it. And yeah, I wrote in 2015, I mean 17, I wasn't experienced. So like, that's that's fine. But like for this book, I thought it was going to take off like crazy. It did not. It did not. I would say that in general, the first novel of a debut series, because that's what this was, even though I had a book before, like this was a debut series. It was a debut for Casey. This is my first series, you know, very much debut books, book, a lot of debut vibes. Generally, first novel of a debut series is just going to do modestly. A lot of indie publishing is about series reading, thanks to binge readers. This is something that has stayed pretty consistent over the past, uh, I have five years, four years, good gravy. Um, yeah, four years. Binge readers are there and they read a lot. Most of the really voracious readers, they just aren't going to read a series unless if it's complete or near, nearing completion. In short, a lot of sales are going to come later on after more books are out. Either I did not know this, or I just kind of forgot and thought we'd be just like special snowflakes with the big <laughs> breakout best-selling novel. We weren't, no. Regardless of the ups and downs, I am extremely fond of The Changeling's Fortune. I love it very much. I enjoy rereading it, and I enjoy the story very much. So if you want to dive into a magical story this month, you can find the link down below. And if you're interested in more videos on self-publishing a series with a co-writer, remember to like and subscribe because my videos this month are going to be all about publishing the series. And I will see y'all next time. Bye-bye!